Brandon Ellis, welcome to the Dylan Friends Podcast. It's an absolute honour to have you on the show, my friend. Uh, I've wanted to get you on for a long, long time. You've been a busy man and um, let's do it. Looking forward to it, mate. Um, I was happy for the call up 12 months ago, but um, you know, <laughs> you left it this late, so... The pity call up, but nah, I'm happy. <laughs> Mate, I say this a lot. I, I, I had to use some, you know, some boys early because I knew the podcast early days. I want to sort of learn my craft, make sure the skills are learning. I don't want to get all the good stories out early. So... Like yourself, mate, it's it's an incredible story and um, we've known each other for a long time. So I wanted to be highly skilled and in my prime to get this one out, which um, I hope I do it justice, mate, because it is a great one. But firstly, um, how are you feeling, mate? Because you're fresh off a 2020 season, um, fresh off probably the silly season two up in Queensland where you're actually allowed out of your house. How's the last month been for yourself? Um, yeah, it's it's been actually pretty good. Um, being in a hub for seven or so months um, wasn't ideal, but... You know, I was pretty lucky because I had to, I could um, live from home and live from my own house. Whereas um, these Melbourne teams have come up and yeah, they've had to do it a lot tougher than me. Um, so yeah, I was pretty grateful that I was able to do that. I only had to go to Wollongong for two weeks and be in a hub there. Um, but yeah, pretty lucky that um, Queensland sort of safe football and I could live from my own home. But um, yeah, it's been a it's been a good month. Um, sort of catching up on going out for dinners and. Catching up with the mates that I haven't been able to see for a while. So, um, yeah, I'm sort of getting over it now. <laughs> Just want to get back to some normality. Mate, how's it been, I suppose? Like, you obviously a Tigers man and you've been there most of your career. First year in um, in the Gold Coast, probably the best year and one of the smartest moves 50-50 that you could have done because you're out of the hub now, but obviously your old team's in the grand final as well, which we will touch on. But how would you find it up in, in the GC first year up there? I know it's a strange season too, so it probably isn't a real test, but it's, you know, the boys went real well. Yeah, look, you know, I've absolutely loved it. Um, sort of, you know, refreshing coming up here. Um, you know, Queensland's a rugby state, so no one knew what AFL, you know, really was up here. So um, you can sort of, you know, before we had to get in these hubs and before lockdown, you could actually go out for dinner, go out for coffee and breakfast and, um, you know, really enjoy your time and not get... Hassled, whereas, you know, what it's like down in Melbourne, um, you know, it's pretty bad. So, um, yeah, it was sort of real refreshing coming up here um, and, yeah, just being part of such a, you know, a young club as well. But um, just to see all the talent that we have and, you know, how exciting it's going to be in the next few years if um, we can gel together. Um, yeah, it's been awesome. Yeah, buddy, I obviously had Matty Rowell on early days. Who's, oh, I listened uh, to that one. That was awesome. How good is he? <laughs> he's, he's just the best bloke, man. I was honestly... Just like in that chat, just going like, is this bloke serious? Like I'm interviewing him and he's like so much better and smarter and he's <laughs> way more than me. Like I just didn't even know what to say. You'd think he'd been in the game for 12 years and played 200 games. Just the way he talks and just the way he is and how professional he is. What was he? Was he Was he genuinely like that when you first met him? Like straight from, you know, when he first came into the Gold Coast? Mate, he's just, it's something like I've never seen before. Like people ask me about him and it's just like, you got to be there to see. He's just so bloody professional and he just absolutely loves football. So he could train all year round and not get sick of it, not get burnt out. Whereas, you know, most players, they need that that time off to um, sort of refresh and rejuvenate. But he's just, I don't know, he's literally one of a kind. Um, and <laughs> you should see the shape he's in now. Like, he's so fit at the moment <laughs> and so strong. I'm dead set scared for 2021, like, just him going around. Three votes, man. He was winning the, he was winning the Brownlow last night in his first year. Like, he's actually a joke. Um, he probably hasn't done himself any wonders, though, because um, teams already know how good he is. So I think next year, you know, it'd be a pretty difficult year because you'll probably get sat on um, most games. But, yeah, you know, coming off his first three games, um, I think he'll be able to shake the tag pretty well. I normally like to talk about the first time we met in a, in a, in an instant, and I was rattling my brain today working this out because I've probably known you for, I reckon I'm going to say like 20 years, maybe over 20 years. When do you think, because I feel like I've got a real early memory that you wouldn't know. Oh. When do you think your first time would, would have been to, that we caught, we, we met? Um, it's been a couple of times. I reckon the one time that comes to mind... It was when EDFL used to play um, Yarra Junior Football League in their rep teams. I think we played you guys two years in a row, and you guys won them both against us. But I remember playing you. But then there was another time when 
I remember you made this grand final. Uh, you guys played, it was Toby Green's team. Who was it, Ashburton? Yeah, Ashburton, yeah. <laughs> I don't know if many people know this, but um, yeah, so I remember going down to watch you because I was pretty good mates with um, you, Brocky, and or sort of Hell Hunter. And you three were playing together and Brockstab was the uh, the coach. And you kicked this absolute pearl of a goal from the boundary and your celebration to the crowd was something I'll never, ever forget. <laughs> and that was that. I reckon that's sort of probably one of our – Probably one of the first like real real memories that comes to head, but um, interesting to see what uh your one is, <laughs> mate. I reckon mine is about five years earlier, um, even more actually because oh we yeah. Well, you went to Princess Hill Primary School, yeah, and I went to oh, North Fitzroy Primary School. I know. So we we used to play each other, each other in like round robin footy competitions, right? At Princess Park. At Princess Park. Yeah. So you grew up right near Princess Park. <laughs> yeah. The, the, the first memory I had of you, and I absolutely despised you for this, was we were playing a round-robin game, and I think we were undefeated in this competition, and we came up against your school, Princess Hill Primary, yeah. and I think you kicked a goal after, like, the siren to, like, to win the carnival for your team. Oh, man. I actually don't even remember that, but it sounds about right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it definitely was. No, I do remember those days. Was. Hey, oh, we used to... um. Yeah, we used to walk up from uh, our school up to Princess Park and, uh, yeah, you guys used to all rock up on your buses and, yeah, mate, it was, I actually do remember that. I think, yeah, it was, it was just us two, um, us two schools that played off the last, maybe in year five and year six or whatnot. Um, can't really remember many other schools that were there, but no, I actually no. do remember that. Mate, yeah, no, I, man, I remember that. I did set remember that like it was yesterday. It was flashbacks to Brandon Olsen, the MCG that we, uh, <laughs> we've come to know today. Mate, oh. I want to take you a little bit further. So I suppose throughout our juniors careers, we obviously crossed over a lot. Yeah. Um, always a big admirer of yours. And we actually tried to poach you at our junior team a lot yeah, as well, yeah, which yeah. I reckon you were close to coming, very close to coming at one stage. Yeah. Uh, I, yeah, I remember, um, yeah, oh, Brock, Brock's dad, Matt McLennan, obviously was a coach. And, um, yeah, he was doing everything that he can, could to, uh, to get me down to, to you boys. But, um, I don't know, I just couldn't do it. Um, I just couldn't leave my uncle and my cousin that, um, you know, was my coach at the moment and my cousins, you know, was my best mate. And, um, I, yeah, I don't know, I just couldn't do it. I uh, couldn't change leagues. And, yeah, I, I do really think about that, though. Um, when I was coming on this podcast, I was like, oh, that's probably one thing that he's going to bring up. Um, what excuse do I have? <laughs> but there's no real excuse. I just couldn't leave the boys. Nah, mate, it's, it, it speaks volumes of yourself. You're too loyal, and we'll get into that soon yeah. um, with, with your mates and, and what it's been like for you growing up. But uh, firstly, um, under-18s was, was probably the next time for you where it took footy to the next level because I want to talk about prior to Richmond um, – you were obviously a gun football, and we, and we know that. But early days as well, like you probably weren't making any of those reps teams. Like you, yeah. you'd missed out on those a fair bit. Like you didn't make, you know, 15, 16s. But then your 18th year, you you sort of exploded onto the scene and, and really, you know, took over. What what changed? Do you think for you was it just put like development yourself? Because you're always a pretty big boy and you're yeah. quite fit. But you just sort of exploded in that last year and really just took over. Yeah. So um, I don't know. It's probably when I was like. 13 or 14, you know, I probably wasn't as big as the, the other kids, um, like height-wise, um, you know, or, you know, with muscle or anything. So I started hitting the gym probably as a 14, 15-year-old, and I just started really, like, getting belief in my own body and some confidence, you know, that I could actually match it with the bigger boys. And, you know, I did miss out on the, I think, the 15s and 16s big team. Um, and I was lucky enough to to play quarter cannons, you know, my bottom age, basically, I think I came in around six or around seven and played every game that year and we ended up going on to win the grand final and I had a pretty pretty good final series and then yeah got the uh the Vic Metro letter to say you know come try out um and then yeah we played the uh, then we had a few practice games um you know played pretty well on them and then yeah I got the uh the nod to to put the Vic jumper on and you know played the the five carnival games and was lucky enough to get awarded all Australian so um yeah it happened you know really quick for me um you know, from a kid that was, you know, 14 years old to probably 6, 7 or 7, I didn't really probably believe in myself and believe in my ability that I could match it with, you know, you boys that had been in those Vic systems for three or four years prior. Um, but, yeah, now I just probably had two breakout years and um, <laughs> the rest is history. <laughs> happened really quick. I think it was pick 15, was it? You went in yeah. the draft to, to Richmond. A lot of those teams around you were obviously like Giants picks as well. So, obviously, yeah, that was when Toby and all that got taken to 
interstate. You were able to stay in 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 Melbourne, obviously where you grew up. Yeah. Talk us through that, I suppose, like rocking up to Richmond because at that stage, like it wouldn't have been, and it probably definitely wasn't the Richmond we know today. Like, yeah. You know that was when Richmond were probably as well as Carlton, like growing up, they were like probably yeah, in a pretty bad spot, like yeah. right down the bottom. What are your early memories of getting drafted? Was there any sort of distinct memories that, that stick out of as, you know, working in the door your first day or in your first season? Um, yeah, so the draft was on a Thursday and, yeah, so I got picked up and then Richmond were going to um, America for Arizona camp for two weeks on the Sunday. So I went in on the Saturday, you know, met a couple of leaders, um, like Kochi, Lids, I think Darcy was there um, and a few others. And then, anyway, I get to the airport on Sunday um, and I love my sweets. I love my chocolate. I love my lollies there. <laughs> so I get there as an 18 year old, um, buy a chocolate bar before we got to, about to walk on the plane. I started eating it and Lids tapped me on the shoulder. He goes, would Gary Ablett be bloody eating that? And that was the first <laughs> thing he said to me. <laughs> But I put it in the bin and I was like, oh, my God. So, all right, I know what I'm in for now. <laughs> Man, Lids, I can so see Lids doing that. He's just yeah. <laughs> so ruthless, especially to the young boys. Yeah, and he, like, he was someone, you know, that I, I loved watching, um, you know, the last, you know, couple of years before I got drafted because he's an absolute gun and, you know, he was his whole career. But, um, yeah, for him to say that to me, I was just like, oh, there's, like, no stuffing around here. It's just like, all right, we're on here. I'm with the big boys. Like, I'm... You know, a little fish in a big pond now. Um, I sort of just got to earn the respect as quick as I can. And, yeah, what a two weeks it was over in Arizona. <laughs> From that time, um, there was a massive shift then at Richmond because this is something like, you know, we all know about this, but I've never yeah. really actually known about it because I think it was around the 2016-17 season, pre-season, yeah. um, a part of a massive sort of turnaround. There was a reflection exercise called the Triple H sessions yeah. so that was hero hardship highlights yeah um firstly who initiated that like how did it come about yeah and when did you realize that you would play a massive role in that as well so at 2016 was like was sort of the breaking point you know of the Richmond footy club we just we'd played three elimination finals you know we lost them all in 13 14 15 then come 2016 like we expected big things and we just failed like miserably you know dimmer's head yeah, everyone was calling for dimmer's head everyone was telling for kochi to step down or they should move clubs um so it was a you know it was a very very tough year for you know the sort of the senior players of our group um you know we just lids had left like we just lost one of you know our vice captain um i think troy chaplin had retired so like there was you know a lot going on um and i think you know i think dimmer just went away um to america it might have been um, to this was an authentic leadership course. Um, I think he done that in end of 2016, and then I think he met um, a bloke named Ben Crow, who <laughs> you know Crow really well. You know he sort of bloody changed the Richmond Football Club, um, and it was just about basically embracing vulnerability. You know, because as men and as athletes, like we think we just have to be so tough and so strong all the time, and we can handle anything. Whereas, um, you know. So many of us, as you would know, we bottle so many things up, and if we're like we don't get it out now, we don't talk to someone, like it just it's a burden on you. Um, mm-hmm. And I think that's what was happening, you know, at the times and with Dima, and you know, thinking he had to control everything, and with Kochi thinking he had to be like the perfect captain, and um, you know, he couldn't not be perfect. He didn't want people to see his flaws because then they would, you know, wouldn't think of him as highly. And it was just all this stuff going on that was just so untrue that um, he just needed to unpack. So um, yeah, we went away to camp. And it was this exercise called the the Triple H, so like a hero, hardship, and highlight. Um, and it, the sort of the theme was if you know if my teammates really knew me, they'd know this about me. And like I'd been at the club for five years, and like no one besides maybe one or two people like knew like where I grew up or anything because I was sort of pretty ashamed by it. Um, and I didn't want people to know sort of my hardship because they you know they'd think different of me they think you know being an AFL footballer you know you grew up in this nice house you know your parents are rich you had money you know everything was sort of given to you um so yeah I was I spoke to Kochi before it and like he goes you're gonna go first like I need you to tell your story and I was like oh man like I was shitting myself like so nervous because like I never really told this story um then, yeah, I got up there. I had to have it on my phone. Like, I had to read off something. Otherwise, my, you know, train of thought <laughs> just would have gone out the window. Um, and then, yeah, I got it, you know, I got it done. Probably took 10 or 15 minutes. And then, like, you know, everyone started clapping, started standing up. And, like, people were crying. I'm just, like, I felt like it was just, like, the biggest weight off my shoulders. Like, 
you know, ever. And yeah, I think, you know, that sort of changed the Richmond Football Club. It was just about embracing vulnerability and embracing everyone's imperfections. So, um, yeah, <laughs> that's about it. Mate, it's it's absolutely incredible, man. I'm getting like honestly, just have goosebumps thinking about it because I know, <laughs> I suppose for everyone that's listening to Ben Crow's episode, they'd understand that completely. And to see, yeah. you know, how that probably happened firsthand um, at a footy club, and and obviously with your story is yeah. is the main thing. Now, I I know your story, like I I know your story from you know growing up, and we've got a lot of mutual friends, and we've been mates for a long time. Yeah. Um, and I've never even you know we've never spoken about this in terms of like we together because I just respect that it's your story and that you know that that's your story and that's the way that it is but I would love to for you to be able to sort of share what you're happy to share with that if if you are yeah um would you be happy to sort of go into what you had to what you spoke about and what what you know you've been through through your life with your hero hardship and highlight and, yeah. and how that sort of went through it yeah easy well it's it's pretty yeah, it's out there in um in I think the the Richmond book that the blah uh, that Conrad wrote in two thousand seventeen. So like you know I'm not gonna shy away from it. But yeah, so I got up there and I spoke about my hero being um my old man and I just spoke about how um well so he's obviously been diagnosed with cancer twice. So there was one time when I was about twelve, um he had kidney cancer, so that was pretty easy to get rid of, just took his kidney out. <laughs> See you later. <laughs> um anyway and then so that a serious one came back in two thousand and fifteen. He um he was just like feeling his neck and he goes, oh, just a bit weird, like a bit of a lump there. When I got scans um, <laughs> and they said, shit, like you've got, I think, esophagus or throat cancer. They were saying, you know, I can't really remember at the time. And then he goes, oh, all right, well, you know, what's to go? How do we get rid of it? And then like, you know, more tests got done and then they're like, you know, well, this is pretty far gone. Like we're not quite sure how this is going to go or even if the treatment's going to work, like, you might not have like much longer to live. And he's just like, what do you mean? Like, <laughs> how has this come out of nowhere? And, like, I haven't known. Um, anyway, so like they gave him the options to do the treatment and whatnot. And he goes, of course, I'm going to do it because you know, I've got three kids. So I've got a, a younger sister and a younger brother as well. Um, and so, yes, as a 15 year old or might have been 14, like finding that out, you know, as in, you know, like the old man, he's like, he's the best man. Like you do everything together growing up. Like he takes you to footy trainings, like, takes you all the games. He's just like your best mate, like your right-hand man. Um, and then, yeah, so for him to tell me that, um, you know, I sort of just didn't want to play footy anymore. Um, so I sort of, I was opted out of the Barry Davis squad in the, at the quarter cannons um, as a 16-year-old or 15-year-old, I can't really remember. Um, and then, yeah, like I stopped going to school. I just wanted to be with him because, like, we didn't really know how much longer he was going to, you know, have to go. Anyway, then, like, fast track six months of, like, he had pretty heavy chemo pretty heavy radiotherapy um and then he goes back and gets some like scans and they're like shit like it's gone he's like he's, what do you mean like you said you know that this was basically too far gone we couldn't get it i uh, couldn't you know get on top of it and they're like well yeah it's just gone so um yeah i guess you know he would, probably was my hero he just shows like and just never give up um and just keep fighting um and it was one time when he was getting chemo, he told one of my best mates, Richard Baxalis, who you know pretty well. Um, like, and I overheard him telling me this. I was in my room and Richard come over and he goes, whatever happens, mate, he goes, just please look after Brandon. Please make sure he gets back into footy again. And when I heard that, I was just like, you know what? You know, stuff for everything. I'm just going to play football for my old man. Because, you know, I overheard him say that um, to my best mate who was in the lounge room with him. Um, so, yeah, and I guess sort of the, you know, the rest is just history, but yeah, it was just sort of my hero, just to to show like to just never give up. Um, and yeah, so then my hardship, I was just another one I spoke about was um, you know, growing up in commission flats. So I grew up in yep. the North Carlton commission flats for like eighteen years. Um, you know, so all my mates had houses, had cars, um, you know, had backyards, had their own rooms, and you know, I was just this kid like who shared a room with his little brother. Um, you no know, family could probably couldn't, you know, really afford the rent each month. Um, and yeah, so I guess sort of that was my hardship, just some of the things that I went through um, and how, how I used to like walk a, a different route to school because like I didn't want the kids to see where I grew up because I sort of, um, you know, through primary school and at the start of high school, like sort of got picked on for not living in a house or having a backyard. So yeah, I sort of, um, yeah, that was my hardship. Um, so I spoke about that. And then my highlight was, yeah, obviously 
getting drafted to the Tigers and um yeah you know so thankful and grateful for them because they've obviously shown me a new life and um yeah sort of picked me up off my feet and you know I'm able to help out my family now so I sort of got them out of the flats and help them pay you know rental for a house um obviously got a couple of places of my own so yeah it's amazing what you can do when you when you work hard and you're disciplined and you know you keep at something so um yeah that's sort of my hero my hardship and my highlight that it I spoke about, but if, yeah, if there's any more you want me to elaborate on, I'm more than happy to. But yeah, I get it's still like a little bit emotional talking about it. Oh, mate, I'm just been taking that in for like, that is unbelievable. Seriously, like I've, you know, I think, oh, I'm actually a little bit emotional. <laughs> I'm just even thinking about it too, bro. Like it's, it's, it's such an incredible story. And I, like, I've known you for so long and, mm. and haven't never heard you probably tell that story yourself, but I know, I know of your story, but to yeah. hear it firsthand is, is you know it gives me goosebumps um as you know mate we've we've got a lot of mutual friends as well and and yeah. how highly you know people regard you um not only your teammates but your friends as well because you're such yeah. a such a loyal and and good man can you can you talk us through i suppose growing up um as you said with in the commission flats with with other mates and i won't name who they are but, but our, our mutual friends as well but um, growing up with them and, and what, what what was that like? What were some of the things that you guys, you know, there was obviously good times as well, but there was obviously some hard times with that as as, as we can see. Um, no, nah, so I guess, you know, there's probably two of my close mates that I grew up with, Wimule and their names are Omar. And I guess, you know, we're still best mates now because we sort of went through our childhood together. We sort of, um, you know, had to lean on each other through the hard times, you know, growing up and like we just knew what it was like growing up where we did. So like we did get each other. Um and obviously, you know, I go to high school and I meet, you know, a great bunch of mates and like, um, you know, I had the other guys that would bully me, but then I had my little close group that would, um, you know, stick fat by me and actually be my mate because of who I am, not because of what I had or what I didn't have. Um, you know, and I guess that's just why, you know, loyalty is like, a, it's a massive thing to me because, um, you know, without some loyal friends or, you know, without, without you know, your loyal family members, like you'd, you sort of get nowhere in life. Um, so, yeah, I guess... Yeah, that's sort of, sort of, yeah, I really got for you. But, um, yeah. I suppose opening up to your teammates, you talk about vulnerability um, and, and when you first got up there to do it, was it something that came natural to you, I suppose? Like, was it oh, was no. it something that you were passionate about or was it something that you ever thought you'd be able to do? And, and how, I know you said, you know, so many people received it so well, but did you think it would have the impact on your teammates that it, that it did? Nah, definitely not. And man, I was shitting myself. I'm not gonna lie. Like I, I, like still to this day, like I still hate talking in front of like big crowds or even like getting up and speaking in front of teammates. Like I don't know, I just get, I don't know, really like tired and, and nervous. So I'm, um, you know, being 22, 23 years old, having to do that first up off the rank, I'm just like, man, I don't know how this is gonna go. That's why I had to write it down on my phone because there's no way I could have just remembered it. Um, but yeah, Kochi was, you know, Kochi was awesome to me. You know, he sat at the front and every time I was, you know, sort of getting a bit scared or was losing my, my words, I could look at him and he's just like calm me down. So um now he was fantastic throughout that stage. But yeah, oh, I don't know, yeah, it's just as I said, like it was a huge monkey off the shoulders and like people just knew, you know, me for who I am and like I did things the way I did because of, you know, my past and like growing up and everything. So like people understood why I did things the way I did. Um so yeah, as I said, like it was a massive turning point for the club, um, and yeah, it was bloody, bloody fantastic. Um, but yeah, I still to this day <laughs> shit myself in front of crowds and and being vulnerable. But you know, I guess that's where your biggest um, your strengths come from is making yourself feel uncomfortable. Hundred percent. I suppose it just made you so much closer with with your teammates. Now you know, I, I know you've got a really incredible bond with with Koch and and with Dusty and, and the boys, yeah. and um, obviously it's gone on to win two flags. And that- maybe their third one. <laughs> I know, I know. I know. I Don't hope worry. Do. We'll, I hope they do. We'll get into that. We'll get into that. Um, through that that exercise, a triple H exercise. Um, that's you know, like externally, I wasn't in the, in the four walls, so I can't be a you know a massive kind of. But it was one of the many sort of facets that changed the club. Yeah. And I want to say it's a massive factor. You were the first person to get up and do that, so you've played an incredible role in that. Yeah, um, I know. First, Sam, but standard high. <laughs> what, what changed from there, like? day to day like what was the feeling like did it actually fully change i don't know just the way people went about things did it change the reviewing of system did it make footy become more of you know you're just really grateful for where you are and knowing everyone's story being able to connect more and on a personal level you you care more for your teammates like yeah it's things that clubs try and get like man i've been at 
you know, I was in the system for eight years and, yeah. you know, like every club tries to do a, a thing, but I feel like it's they don't really thing. work, yeah. you know, it doesn't work unless everyone's in it. Like, yeah. and, and if you're, if, if the buy-in's not there, it's not there because, you know, like I said, every club tries to do that. After you guys did that, I swear nearly every single club yeah, tried to do the exact same exercise <laughs> and it, it just didn't work. Yeah. W- why do you think Richmond's were so successful? Before doing that Triple H exercise, Kochi got up in front of the group it's for day one of preseason and just started, like, opening himself up. And um, I guess when the captain gets up there and opens himself up and starts crying in front of the group, like, I think everyone, you don't have a choice, but you have to buy in. And if you don't buy in, well, you're not going to play in. Like, you just get shipped off. Um, yep. So I think that was huge by, by Kochi because, you know, after coming off 2016 year, you know, people were telling him to step down as captain. He, they should retire. And, like, it just... You know, it would have been a huge mental battle for him. But for him to come back and to do that um, just really empowered everyone. But um, I think the biggest thing, you know, come from it was we just could be ourselves. Like we didn't have to try and be someone we weren't and trying to be someone to impress this person or try and be someone else to impress the coach. Like we could just be who we were and people would just embrace us for who we were. And it was just like you could stop, you know, stepping on, you know, eggshells and you could just be free. That I guess is what it was. You used to be free and like, you just would show so much more care towards your teammates because, like, you sort of know their story now and you know what they've been through. And it's just, like, some of the stories that I've heard, like, my, mine's it's okay, but some of the other stories, man, it's just, like, mind-blowing, um, which I won't, I'm not allowed to, you know, talk about. Yeah, yeah, of course, allowed of course. Repeat. But, um, yeah. yeah, and, you know, the I think the third thing that come from it um, at the end of that camp was Dimmer just, he goes, you know what, guys, we're going to simplify this game so much. He goes... Remember when you guys used to play junior footy and how fun it was? Like how fun it was to train and how fun it was to, to just play, just to play footy, not think. He goes, that's the, that's the philosophy we're going to bring in this year. And obviously we had, you know, rules on offense, defense and contest, but it was just sort of just play, just play, like just play football. And I don't know, you could see everyone in 7M was just sort of having fun. Um, and, yeah, you could just see there was like, just so much freedom with our game plan and yeah look at it or look at the Tigers game plan now like it's held them in good set for the last four years but um yeah it's pretty incredible you know I think 2016 had to happen for 2017 and you know the last three years for it to be the way it is I don't think if 2016 didn't happen I don't think the Tigers would be in the position that they're in now um so I think as much as it was you know a crap year it was probably the best thing that happened to the club and probably the best thing that happened to Kochi and Dimmer um so, yeah, it's, um, as bad as it was, it was a blessing in disguise, you know, because look at them now, they're <laughs> about to play oh, for, yeah. for a third flag. No, nah, they're fine. Man, just on that as well, like I reckon even just relating that back to, to not even footy but just into like things that I've even, you know, been through, everyone goes through, like, you yeah. know, yourself and not not to the extremities but you're going to have good times, you're going to have bad times. I'm yeah. like sometimes now like through this whole COVID thing and like even just with a bad week, for example, where you're like down and, and shit goes wrong, like, all of a sudden, I have this feeling now, like, as soon as I'm having, like, a shit time, like, I get excited because I know, like, from a shit time, like, good things are coming from that. And, exactly like, right. that's, like, a way to get through it, I think. Like, you know, you've you've obviously been through that, you know, ups and downs and at, at a more extreme level and, yeah. and things come. But, like, you must look at, like, challenging times now with yourself and know that you just go well from them and, and you can bounce back because you're so resilient. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, it's... It's about what you can control and what you can't control. If anyone's listened to obviously Crow's podcast, like as soon as you start focusing on the things that you can't control, that's when you start to sort of getting getting yourself into a rut. But as soon as you start focusing on the things that you can control and just accept for things for the way that they are, that's when I don't know life is just bloody beautiful. And um, as you know, it's just you know life is hard to get me wrong. But when you just simplify it, um, it's just like with life or just like with football or anything that you do, it's just. It's just a lot better, um, you know. You, you clear thoughts, um, and yeah, it's just a lot easier. So um, yeah, that was sort of another thing that you know we adopted in seventeen as well, which Crowley taught us: um, things you can control, things you can't control. But um, yeah, that's I could talk about that bloke for hours on end. He's incredible. He is. He's he's the goat. And like you're so lucky to get him on your podcast, man. I, I have no how idea how I got him Don't on the show. Know how you like, did that. I, I have no idea how I got him. I think I got him just in a really like sweet spot where he was sort of keen to do it. But if I asked him a week later, I reckon he would have been way too big for it. He's the busiest man in the world. The busiest man. But he, he had he had so much time, man. Like we would have sat down for like two and a half hours and just chatted about all these things. And I listened to it all. I loved it. Yeah. Oh, I loved it. 
I suppose with Ben Crow, how much stuff did you guys do with him? And then I know, I suppose a more broader question in terms of your yeah. footy and, and with Richmond, like how much focus was there on mindfulness? Because I know there's a superstar down there, Emma, Emma Crow, Murray. Uh, Emma, Emma Murray, yeah, sorry, she's a who's, who's doing a lot of work down there as well. Like yeah. what, what sort of stuff did you learn from that? And what have you taken um, into your life and, and up to Gold Coast? And I suppose the, the beauty of mindfulness in footy that I've loved is, like, is all these lessons they teach you about, like elite sport, like life is like an elite sport. Like, so you can just like correlate it back into it. I guess Crow, we did a lot of work with Dimmer and I think Kochi and the leaders. So um, I had a, we had a bit to, to do with certain individuals, but he was sort of more for, for um, to say, yeah, as I said, Kochi and Dimmer and that. But yeah, Emma was sort of like, you know, our, our lady that would, you know, teach us mindfulness. And she came, I think she sort of started a couple of days a week in 2016. Um, didn't really buy into it. I was just like mindfulness, you know, what's his crap? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then, I don't know, we sort of all just bought into it, you know, as a, as a club um, and as a group in 2017. And, yeah, she yeah she's another huge reason as to why, you know, the club's been so successful and as a reason to, um, to why so many individuals have improved their game um, and taken it to a new level. So, um, you know, I still... Chat to Emma, you know, most weeks now, I know being on the coast. Um, but, yeah, she does a fantastic job, you know, with the Tigers boys. Um, yeah, I think, yeah, she works there maybe three or four days a week. But, um, yeah, she, she's just huge on um, basically things, things you can control and things you can't control. Um, and she has this, um, it's a little formula that she uses. It's A times B equals performance. So A is your attributes and the things that you can control. And B is all the, it stands for bullshit. So it's all the stuff that, it's the external factors is what this person doing, what this person saying about that person. Um, can't control whether it's going to be windy, can't control whether it's going to rain. But what you can all, you know, you, it's okay to accept all of that. Make sure you accept it. But what you can always go back to is, you know, your attributes. So what your strengths are as, a, as an individual. And, um, you know, should we just... We just work so hard on, um, you know, there's probably two or three main things, you know, your strengths to, to make yourself a good footballer. You just delve so deep into that and you just get, you just basically imprinted on your brain. So when, you know, shit does start happening on the field or things aren't going your way, you know, you can accept, okay, you're in a bit of a hurricane at the moment, but you can always come back to your attributes and what your strengths are, go back to your anchor. And then, you know, you can just sort of start, you know, from fresh air. Whereas I remember... My first few years, like if I was having a bad game or wasn't getting much of the ball, I, I could be checked out at half time. But like we just, I know all the Tigers boys know, and like from experience, we just, they just never check out. Like they just never yeah. done. Like they just know how to get back to their strengths. You know, they might have three bad quarters, but then the last quarter could be, you know, your moment or your quarter and you could turn it around. So yeah, she's been huge in, in that aspect and, you know, for the footy club. And yeah, like as I said, like she's, she's, you can you can bring that to you know with life as you said um, you know because life is so hectic and, and so busy um, you just got to always control what you can control you know accept that the things you know are out there that are going to piss you off or, or whatnot but um, always go back to you know within yourself and what you, you know you can control. I sort of think though at, at a stage like that as well like that without of going through what you'd been through early days like with those losses like you said it doesn't yeah. nearly it doesn't really mean as much like because. Yeah. You, you go through all that hardship and, and, you know, like you bottom out, you're literally like embarrassed and you bottom out. Then you meet someone like that and they pick you back up. Like you said, oh. sometimes going through the hardest times and all those pressure moments, it brings out the gold, like pressure creates diamonds without, without having a shit time and bottoming out. You don't really learn too much about yourself and you probably don't actually solve. You don't really so, yeah. sort of have to search. Oh, hundred percent. Yeah. Couldn't agree more. And as I said, like without that 2016 year, it'd be a different story. Who knows whether, you know, Tigers would be playing off in the third grand final in four years or whether I have two flags or, you know, whether I'd be up here. Like you just you just don't know. So um, I guess, you know, I'm a huge believer in everything happens for a reason and um, I'm glad 16 happened. <laughs> I, think every, I think every Richmond supporter is as well. <laughs> <laughs> Mate, talk me through a couple of your um, old teammates um, and we'll get into your current ones later, but who's, who's some of your favourite teammates and why? Like, obviously... Um, there's some real superstars there, but I think there might even be some other ones that, that don't get the notoriety that they deserve. Um, my favourite teammates. Well, obviously, you know, I love Koch. He sort of 
took me under his wing as soon as I got to the club. Um, he taught me sort of how to sort of be disciplined and um, and how to be a professional athlete. Sort of just fast track that. Um, you know, I love Nathan Broad, but we're, we were housemates for like three years, so um, we get along, you know, really well. Um, obviously, I'm pretty close with, with Dusty. Um, took us a, a couple of years to say hi to each other because he's probably thinking, Who's, who the hell is this bloody 18 year old coming in the system, winning the time trials? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, and then, you know, I love I love Josh Caddy as well. Um, get along with Cads really well. Um, yeah, I, you know. I've got a couple of favourites, but like everyone just got along with everyone at the club. There was no egos, yeah. really. There was, like, no heroes. Um, everyone was just sort of working towards, you know, that one goal. Um, but, yeah, they're probably just the ones I can reel off the, the top of my head. And then another one, you know, little Jake Arts. I'm not quite sure many people know him. Um, I missed out on six drafts. Um, yeah. Finally got drafted and didn't play at all last year, but sort of played a handful of games this year. Um, yeah, he's just a – he's no, he's got another great story. So, yeah. Um, yeah, he's awesome. Same with Kane Lambert. Love Turtle. Mate, he, have you got him on here before? He's been on. Oh, he would have been early days when I was when I despised you because you never got me on. Early <laughs> the start. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, you you were still flat. But he, <laughs> you know, a bit like yourself, mate, he has, he's just got an incredible mindset and oh. just such a positive um, guy. Like I spoke to him actually today just because I, I like to give him a call um, before the grand final. So he still remembers me after he's won his third. <laughs> But and the normie. he's just genuinely like, I couldn't be happier for a bloke um, yeah. to come through. And, and obviously his story's been told, but missing out on six six or seven drafts or something, still just putting in the work and comes in. Now he's an All-Australian, could be a three-time premiership player. Mate, um, I, I want to say I'm surprised, but like I'm actually just not because yeah. the bloke's just an absolute superstar. Yeah, like when I got drafted, like I'd hear about this Kane Lambert and it was Adam Mark and it was like them two or the two that would always miss out. And I'm just like, who the hell are these guys? And then like, they get drafted together and obviously, you know, it worked out for, for Kane, but I'm just like, no wonder why, um, you know, Dennis's Pagan was calling for Lambo to get drafted for however many years because yeah. he's an absolute gun. And, like, he obviously seen what everyone can see in him now. Um, but, no, I'm so so bloody happy for him. And, you know, it makes it even better because he's just such a ripping bloke. Oh, he's the best uh, bloke in the world, man. Best yeah. bloke in the world. I asked him about footy today and the – like you know the chance to win like his third flag and he goes oh man like you know the only thing that's better than that is that richmond's turned me into a better person i was just like man yeah. sh- sh- I know. shut up <laughs> like just be happy with the three <laughs> flags you know <laughs> like, just, i know he's, he's so such humble, a good dude he? man he's just too nice i'm like just be arrogant yeah. for a little bit man he's it's like okay. sort of the most perfect human organ i've ever come across 100 <laughs> percent, bro 100 percent. um mate it'd be remiss not to ask a question about dusty because he is one of the best players that's ever played the game. Yeah, what what makes him so special? We don't want like what what is he? What's he like? I suppose to train like is there is there a reason why he's so good? Is he just as good as what he is? Like what's he like as a as a teammate? Um, oh, no, he's an, he's an awesome teammate. He does train hard, but you know what? He just goes out there and has fun, and like he just knows that he's a good player. He knows that he's strong. He knows he can bust tackles, and like he knows that he's just can easily, you know, turn a game from his own boot. And he just he just backs himself and he just believes mm. in himself and he just has so much confidence. Um, and as you know, like, if you're a confident player, you can go out there and you can do anything. But as soon as you start yeah. going into your shell, um, and you can sort of go the other way. But, um, you know, credit to him, he does work hard. Um, he does work hard with Emma and he does work pretty closely with Ben Crow. So, like, it's not a fluke that he dominates most weeks. You know, he does put in the work. Um, he doesn't just rock up on game day and say, I'm going to have 30 and kick three. Um you know, it all happens during the week. You know, everything that you do during the week, you know, game day is just sort of like the final product. Um, you just go out there and just show off. But, you know, it all happens during the week. And yeah, he does the work, um, maybe not in his early days. <laughs> but, like, I, I know from, you know, being pretty close within the last four or five years, um, yeah, like, he deserves everything that comes his way. And, man, it could be a third, three-time normie. How good would that be? That'd be unbelievable, bro. I, I seriously wouldn't put it past him. I feel like, you know, I don't, I don't, I've never seen Dusty train and, and, and wouldn't know what he does, but like, I feel like most of his work, man, like, it's just in his mind. Like you said, like, he just believes in himself. Yeah. He, he loves, like, you know, from all reports doing stuff with, you know, I've chatted to Hugh Van Kylenberg. He said yeah. that he, he does work with him. He yeah. does work with Ben Crow, does work with Emma Murray. Gratitude. Like, he's constantly just, like, you know, getting all that stuff through his head, gratitude, self-belief, you know, control the outcomes. It just shows how much, you know, the game is really played above, um, head. above the head. So. Above the shoulders, sorry. <laughs> yeah, above the shoulders, <laughs> above the head, above the shoulders, sorry. Mate, you've dropped it a few times 
to, um, throughout the podcast, so we can't not touch on it. But yeah. two-time premiership player, it's quite nice. It's it's very nice. Oh. What, what is it, by the way, I've always wondered this. Like, yeah. what do you do with your premiership medals? Like, where are they? Do you have it? Well, yeah, I definitely brought them up to um the Goldie. Yeah. They're hiding somewhere in my house. I'm not going to tell you where. <laughs> no, don't tell me where. Oh, uh, uh, yeah, I just. Mine, mine. Now I've got them with both my um my premiership jumps as well. Um, yeah, yeah. I just bring them up, hide them, and. I don't know, every now and then like, I'll get him out and I'll just like look at him and smile and just be like, like how the hell, like why me? Like how did I yeah. get the chance to, to do this? Like no, like no shit. Like yeah, yeah as, it, as it, like when you're growing up, you know, you watch all these grand finals on TV and you just wish you could be there one day, then you envy the teams that win it and then it's just like it happens to you and you're like, what the hell? And then it happens again and you're just like, man, you know, I think it was – it'll sink in and I'll appreciate it a lot more when I finish footy and I can actually look back and reflect. Yeah. Because as you know, man, season's done, party for two weeks, you go away on a holiday, then you come back and pre-season's around. It's just like you don't really get to sort of sit back and really enjoy it. Mate, grand final day. Look, you played in two flags, as you said. What's it like going into a grand final? I I honestly get nervous thinking about it. Like I was obviously there for the Giants um, in in 2019 in the stands, which didn't go too well for them, went very well for yourself. But – how big, like, how big an occasion is that? Like, because yeah. especially for Richmond, like, one of the biggest teams with the most supporters um, in the heart of Melbourne, like, home ground, the MCG. Like, how big was that first one, I suppose, against the Crows and the build-up? And, and, and what's it like? I know how big it is, but, like, how does it actually feel to be doing it? Because I actually just get nervous thinking about it. Yeah. So, I guess... To be honest, grand final day is it's a blur. Like yeah, the week you know for both of them, they're sort of pretty similar. Um, Jim was awesome. Um, after both prelims, he goes, look, I'm not gonna lie, it's not a normal week, grand final week. He goes, it's it's gonna be a hectic week. He goes, I want you guys to embrace it. Embrace every interview you do. Embrace everyone that messages in you. Embrace you know everyone that wants to to call you. He goes, just do it because you never know when it's gonna happen again. Um, and that messaging seven a.m. was the exact same in 2019. Um. But yeah, man, the whole week after Monday or Tuesday, um, I, I started getting nervous. Like my, I struggled to sleep most nights because I was just playing it in my head. I'm like, man, I just, I just don't want to lose. Like we've come this far. Like the fear of failing, um, you know, sort of really sat in my gut. Um, so yeah, I guess that whole week is just, it's just full of nerves. Um, then you got obviously the grand final parade, which is bloody awesome. Um, you know, going down through the city with. <laughs> 200,000 people just screaming at you. Um, and because we played interstate teams both years, like our supporter base was huge. Um, but I couldn't even imagine what it was going to be like if you say the Giants had lost to the Pies and it was a Oh, Collingwood. the Collingwood, that would have been ridiculous. <laughs> I kind of, uh, yeah, I wouldn't have been able to sleep all week. It would have been hectic. One thing I love about grand finals, and I suppose obviously one coming up very shortly, is there's always like moments in games that swing momentum and I suppose like everyone's got like a different moment um there's things that stick out more than others is there anything that you remember really you know clearly from those games and it might not have even been something that got picked up post game or in the meeting or anything but was there any sort of moments for you that really stick out that you you just remember so clearly um I think in 17 when Basha um kick that goal on his left. Um, I don't know, sort of just got everyone up and about and sort of swing the momentum because I think Adelaide had three goals up and they just missed one and then Basha sort of, you know, got that goal back that we really needed. And I don't know, it was just sort of um, an avalanche from then on. But I remember one vividly against the Giants, um, Kochi's tackle on Big Mummy. I don't know if mm. you remember that in the first quarter. Um, I think the Giants kicked the first goal, sort of got their tails up a bit. Um, like we were going well, we just couldn't score. Um, and I think we turned the ball over. Mummy got it, and then Kochi just absolutely just crunched him in the middle of the ground, and then got into him. And I remember just being on the wing, like, man, how good is this? Like, like I'm, I'm like pumped now. Like I'm ready to go. Um, so yeah, that's probably one moment um, in both grand finals that I remember very vividly. But I think the Kochi tackle it turned it. Um, yeah, it was pretty awesome. <laughs> what about post post game? I suppose after festivities, yeah. do you ever go back and and review that as a team, like with the coaches and go through things? Like, do you ever not review yeah. it like defensively or anything, but do you just watch it and like celebrate the good parts or off ball things that you wouldn't have seen game day? Um, oh, so 
not so much after the game. The next day when we you know, we had to go to the club um, to like meet all the the sort of family date there at Punt Road. Um, the game was played on the inside at in the club, like all on the TV. So if we wanted to watch it, we could, but. <laughs> boys are too busy getting blind before they went on stage to watch it anyway yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but nah we nah to be honest we haven't really reflected um we haven't sat down as a team and watched it together um i'm sure every individual sat down and watched it by themselves or with a few other boys but um no it was never really reviewed it was sort of once pre-season came around like we we're like how good was that but like push it aside Punch now on. Yeah, let's go. Like we want another one. You know, you always say you'd be you'd be happy with one. Like you retire a happy man with one. But when you win one, you want two. You want another. And then yeah. You want another. You can never be satisfied. It's just I don't know. It's just like with everything in life. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. No. <laughs> it, be... I can definitely. Yeah. Definitely understand. What about post grand finals? Um, something I'm always quite keen on because I was you know I was at the Giants on the other end. Post grand final wasn't <laughs> yeah. as fun as probably what you guys were doing. Yeah. Um, you know, it was those those. After parties and, and Richmond's club, I suppose, has is, is got a lot of, you know, sponsors and, and whatnot. What were some of the cool things that you got to do um, with the club? Like, was there anything post-season? Obviously, the family day straight yeah. after. Was there a footy trip? Was there any sort of big lunches and stuff put on? Um, so, yeah, both yeah, both years are pretty similar. So, like, after the game, we went to, uh, I think it was a Pullman, which was across the road for, like, a function just with, like, our family and our friends. Um, I think all the corporates and a few supporters and then we had an after party in the city it was above cq i think it was called daha or something and they um yeah good old jakey king organized it for us uh he knew the owner (laughs) so yeah that was all put on for us from like 12 o'clock to five and then obviously you got to go home and you got to look half fresh for the next day because you got um family day so have family day all day and then like that night i think um grigo organized something at the osborne for us um so that was all like sort of paid for as well and then you have a mad monday and then you have best and fairest the next night so like it's a hectic week like there's no nights off yeah um and i think i think you know what? i think wednesday that's the sort of night that you sort of catch up and sleep and and you know get a meal into you but then thursday um <laughs> the team like the winning team that played we have this signing day um where you sort of get go to the club and you sign as many things, you know, as this company gives you and you sort of get paid for it. So, you know, having beers there from like 10 o'clock in the morning, listen to music. Um, then obviously you go out that night and then oh, yeah. have a few nights off. And then, yeah, the boys went to footy. I went to Thailand for footy trip. Not allowed to call it footy trip, but yeah, they went there for footy trip for, I think it was six nights. But um, I had, I ended up just taking lovely to Bali because we had a hectic few days had to come up to Gold Coast had to you know sign the contract and um yeah we had like a hectic off season plan so like we just needed to get away you know just me and her so we went to Bali for two weeks and yeah man and had like Grimes' wedding when we got back and yeah it was, it was hectic it was just a hectic off season I can imagine that's probably what the, the big part is now because after that you've won two flags at Richmond you're obviously a very happy man you've been there since the start mm-hmm. um how did how did the move come about and like how early on I suppose like did that was that playing on your mind like you know I'm I'm always so interested in trades I love trade period in, in terms <laughs> of like you know going through your head you've got to look at these offers but for you man yeah. like you know you're a staple in a in a team but then you also got an unbelievable opportunity to yeah to go up to the Gold Coast a new experience and try it like what what went through your head how early did you have to sort of make the decision and and when did you make it and how yeah. hard was it um. Yeah, so at the start of 2019, I um I didn't play round one. I sort of got dropped after the NAB Cup. And then I was just like to my manager, like, man, like, I got dropped for the 2018 final series. And I was just like, you know, am I sort of being pigeonholed here? Like, how long do I actually have left here? And I was a free agent coming out of 2019. Um, anyway, then halfway through the year, like, I got back to the team, played every game. And halfway through the year, um, I had a meeting with list management. And they said, look, salary cap's tight. Um if you want to stay, you've got to sort of take half a pay cut. Otherwise, like, we can't keep you. And I was like, far out. Like, you know, not what I wanted. Like, I would have stayed and, you know, been a one club player if I could have been. But, you know, that's that's another another story. But, um, yeah, so I obviously started having to have meetings with other clubs, which felt so weird. Like, I'd be going to training, <laughs> playing games, and then, like, on a Tuesday after training, I'd go and meet, you know, like, Essendon or the Suns or Carlton. Or, uh, it, was, it was weird. Like, I felt uncomfortable like I sort of knew it was the process that had to go down. Um, you know, you've been through it yourself. You sort of know 
Well, well, yeah, I didn't really have a choice, oh, yeah. but it was, it was well, anytime, anytime, doing that. Anytime, really, like, you're not... Yeah, but they actually wanted you. I had to go and, like, sell myself. It was, it was a little bit different. Yeah, so anyway, like, I had... I'd met up with Carlton a few times, and I was pretty set on going there because, like, I grew up in Carlton. Um, you know, I'd, I'd gone up to over that many times, and, like, Carlton was just sort of, like, next door, you know, neighbour to where, you know, I, I was living and grew up. So I was like, yep, yeah, set on going there. I don't know, then it sort of just fizzled out a bit, um, that. And then, yeah, I was like, hmm, well, I know the Suns are, are really keen. Um, they'd showed interest, you know, probably from halfway through that year, same as Carlton. And then, yeah, they just put an offer, a nice juicy offer there, <laughs> which, you know, I couldn't really say no to because I didn't really have much else, you know, going on outside of, you know, the Suns. I had a few other, like, clubs that were half keen. But the biggest thing was, you know, as much as I wanted to make the move, was like trying to convince my partner Sarah to to make the move, to make her, you know, basically drop everything, drop her career, drop her life, and move up just to pursue my career. So that was sort of um, it was pretty hard to you know to try and convince her, but um, yeah, I guess it was pretty bittersweet because we got to you know experience the finals together, we got to finish on the flag, and it was like you know what. Like what? What better way to like sort of you know leave you know on this note and I don't know we sort of just come to terms. Um, but it's like, look, it's only five years. Um, you know, I'll make sure I get you a good job up here. We'll make sure you know you get flights home to see your family every now and then. Which the sons were awesome, like that. They looked after us so well. Um, then bloody COVID hit. Yeah. Oh, so yeah, that's another story. But um, yeah. So that that was sort of um, yeah. So the second half of that nineteen was was hectic for me. Like my mom was just everywhere. Um. You know, trying to play good footy, trying to stay in the team. Then a final series comes around, and yeah, then like having to make a decision because after grand final week was trade week. I'm just like, oh my god! But um, that's where you oh, know yeah. the mind training that I had done sort of came in and helped me heaps. And obviously, speaking to Erin Murray most days, and like her helping me through it was was awesome. So um, yeah, it was a hectic time of year, but yeah, wouldn't change it. You know, loved it up here so far. Mate, that's unbelievable. Um that you know you had to make that decision at a time when you're playing in a grand final too and and oh, still, you like have to deal with with all that shit yeah i know and like i sort of kind of made it on my mind a couple of weeks prior to the granny um just so i could be at peace with it um and sort of let it sink in but um then all then grand final week all these journos like started leaking it out saying alice is, is playing his last game for richmond blah 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 and i'm just like this is not what i need grand final yeah. week like oh my god what happened ended up happening with like did you did you um obviously like you know the boys understand I feel like it's the game's got to that stage now yeah. where everyone knows you got to do what's best for you but how did you tell your the your teammates and the guys that you're close with did you tell them like you probably waited for after the season obviously or nah so I don't know I was pretty like open and honest with him because like there was so much like speculation going around all these articles coming out and like I just told the leaders and I told a couple of the other senior boys and my close mates, like, look, this is a situation I've been put in and this is what I've decided on. So, like, if people, you know, ask, can you just please just, like, tell them this and just, like, shut it down because I don't want it to, like, to, you know, stop us from going all the way again because it can be a big distraction at times. As, yeah. Uh, yeah. As you know, like, oh, being at the that's Giants. That's incredible, man. Years. It's so cool that, like, you, you know, you had had those conversations and they still just said, mate, no, we just keep punching on and play. Like yeah, they support some him teams can be so, so immature well. like that and just be like, nah, well, he's, you know, if he's going to leave, um, yeah. you know, despite whether it's his choice or not, like we're not going to want that, but you still played in a grand final and them knowing the things were happening. Like yeah, that I just know. seems like such a mature outfit. Yeah. And I guess that's just why they're being so successful as well. Like they just don't hold grudges. And if you want to do what you want to do to help yourself, like just do it. Like, been in the game for such a short period of time. Um, yeah, you can sort of be shitty or or whatnot, but sometimes, as you said, like people don't have a choice. So just just be there for them, be happy for them, and like you know, wish them success. You know, they're the new club that they go to, and I guess that's why Tigers were, were so awesome. Like I could be so open and honest with most of the playing group. Um, you know, come before just before finals time, and yeah, it made it a lot easier. Whereas you know. <laughs> If I had my teammates potting me or saying this, I'm a bad person saying that, I'd be like, oh, I don't know how it would have went. <laughs> oh, mate. No, nah, well, it's, it speaks volumes to yourself, mate, in your own character. You'll be welcome back there with open arms um, when, when you finished when you finish footy. But one thing you can't tell me um, with the move to Gold Coast is there's no way you can say <laughs> that you thought the Gold Coast were going to be as good as what they were this year oh. when, you, when you decided to come up here. Man, like, it was no. un. 
unbelievable. Like you've walked in, well, not walked in this team, but you've come in there as a senior player. Yeah. And you know you you've come up there bringing all the experience of of two finals, playing with like all these incredible players. You've come up there to teach all these guys, but like it just seemed like it's you know the transition's been seamless. I knew how bad the year was last year because um, you know I'd spoken to a few of the boys. Like I'd known Alex Sexton for a while um, before yeah. like. I'd gone there, so I'd spoken to him. But, yeah, that, their second half of 2009 was horrendous. I think they lost most games for more than 100 points. And, like, I sort of knew what I was walking into. And what, what I, they have the talent. Like, don't get me wrong, but they just didn't have any confidence. Like, their belief was yeah. just shot, because, as it would be after losing all those games. Like, blokes just, I guess, just forgot to play footy and to play for each other. I guess once you start losing plenty of games in a row, you start going to self-preservation mode, like how can I play well to keep my spot in the team so I can play next week, you know, so I can get paid yeah. whether you're on matches or, or whatnot. Like that that just goes through your head. Like it went through my head as a young kid. And like 100%. people got to like, remember, these guys are so young. So no, I guess I just, yeah, I just tried to bring some belief and, and some confidence back into the boys and just to, to sort of help them realize what their strengths are and just to play to their strengths. Um, and it was sort of refreshing, like, yeah, we only won five games this year, but we lost, I think, four or five games by under a goal, and we were in probably four or five more. So, like, there was no real blowouts besides probably that round one and our last game of the year. Um, so, yeah, it was awesome, but, yeah, like, I'm so used to winning, so, like, I want to win more now. Like, I want to start winning more games next year. <laughs> oh, mate, I'm sure you will. Um, I've had a massive – I actually bought a – Nick Holman hustled me that hardly to buy a membership <laughs> this remember- year. <laughs> And and he still he said that he'd get He's me a signed jumper of Matt Rao. He was like messaging me every day to buy memberships. So I ended up buying a couple of memberships. Yeah. I actually thought that I was like trying to give my membership away to someone in Gold Coast, but it wasn't actually a membership for games. It was just a support membership. Yeah. So you don't actually even get anything for supporting. It was just basically a membership just to, to help out. To anyway, break our record. I donated. I just just to break the record. Yeah. So I've, I can honestly say I've helped. Yeah, you have. Um, okay, thanks, yeah. thanks, mate. I appreciate it. <laughs> so I was there from the start, yeah. a supporter, um, as well as yourself. I supported the move. But, mate, the young talent at, at Gold Coast is fucked. It's honestly fucked. I've, I've probably never seen anything like it. Um, I've got to Rankin. Rao, Anderson, Lukosius, the King, uh, Ben King, Weller, Bows, Ben Ainsworth, Charlie Ballard, um, and I. Even though these boys aren't young, they're old and and um, nearly times up. I can't not mention Alex Sexton, Alex Sexton, and Nick Holman. It's but cool. these these boys, man, like how exciting are they to play with? And I suppose the main question you can't give me a soft answer here. Who is the best in your eyes? Matt Rao, mate, hands down. <laughs> yeah. Okay, he 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 doesn't do like freakish things like Rankin does or what Lacocious can do or what King can do, but he's just yeah. just like just got everything. He's fit, fast, strong, kick on both feet. He's just great hands. Like he, you build a team around him. Um, as you know, he's just going to be ultra consistent every week. Not saying the other blokes aren't going to be as well, but I just. From what I've seen, those first three games, like it's the first, those three games are the best three games I've ever seen by a first year player. No, it's hands down. It's incredible. He's a superstar. All right, <laughs> I'm not so, saying it because I know you love him. No, I know. I, man I know. Too, but, mate. I honestly like. I feel like I've got to hold back on what I say about him because it's getting a little bit weird, you know, talking about him too he much. Loves but it. it's it's pretty <laughs> special, man. He's he's a fair superstar at the yeah. moment. I love that all he rocks is his career savers. <laughs> And I've sent him up about 15 um, T-shirts as well yeah. just to keep... He yeah, wears them as well. He trains right in them. I oh, know. Yeah, he <laughs> oh, trains in the grey one. It gets me going. And I'm like, it gets me going. Mate, you just all you're doing is showing you sweat. Like, put a blue one or something <laughs> on. But no, nah, he loves it. I see him flaunting around everywhere. But um, Besides besides Rio, is there another one that you love playing with that you think could be up there with, with him? Oh, Ben King. Yeah. Mate, he's a superstar. He's, like, he, yeah. Wait till he has a few more years in the gym, gets a bit stronger. Like, because he, he gets his hands to everything. So, once he gets a bit stronger, he'll be able to hold those contested marks. Um, but he's just so agile and just so fast for like a bloke who's over 200 centimeters. He, um, yeah, I think him and his brother for the next 10, 12 years are going to be absolute superstars. Um, you've seen what Max could do this year, and obviously, you've seen glimpses of what Ben could do. Um, yeah, he's another one that, um, like, I know it's just going to be a gun because he works so hard. Yeah, it's exciting, those boys. I've actually locked them in early for, for a podcast oh, yeah. in the off-season Lucky too, I so got him when I did. Otherwise, <laughs> I don't know if, you know, after the year that they failed, I don't think I would have got anything where... Yeah. Got. <laughs> <There'd> be, <laughs> Might just start taking some... half a pay cut soon. Oh, seriously, seriously. <laughs> I'll, I'll keep I'll them. Free. Anything. <laughs> That's it. Um, 
coming up from Melbourne as well, and we chat about this a lot when we've we've crossed over. But how much have you loved coming from Melbourne, like a footy dominated state, and then playing now in Gold Coast? And how much do you think now that like guys have experienced that in the hubs? Yeah. They're going to want to come up and play with Gold Coast and Sydney teams and and you know Perth teams. I yeah. suppose Perth is actually not really one of them because it's far. it's a footy footy dominated state. Too but far. you know mainly those New South Wales Queensland um, yeah. teams. How much do you think guys are going to come up now and really like request to play for these teams? Oh, I think heaps. Like I've spoken to Mark Evans, um, the CEO, and he goes, he's never had so much interest um, of clubs wanting to move. Uh, people wanted to move um, to the Suns. He's had to like knock people back and knock managers back. Like seriously, where they've never had that problem before. So as bad as um, COVID was, um, it's probably been the best thing for the Suns. And, you know, obviously Brisbane and the New South Wales teams as well. Um, just to show, you know, what it's like to be in a state where no one knows footy and you can be normal. Mm. Like it, it's awesome. Um, so yeah, we'll see what happens, you know, come the next few years for all these clubs. But, um, I think, yeah, it's been fantastic for um, Queensland footy. No, it has, mate. It's been good. Mm. Um, mate, I want to just change the pace up a little bit now because you, as much as I love your on-field, I love your off-field even more because <laughs> you're a bona fide hustler. You, 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 you seriously are. You, you, you are. You were, the, you were the start of, of you know, footy players starting their own brands and businesses. Oh. Um, you've really, really set yourself up, I suppose, in terms of that, that business side of things. And one thing I've always wanted to talk to you about was, was your business, Uncle Jack? Um, obviously, premium watches. How did it all come about off field? Like, were you always yeah. wanting to be engaged off field? I know you set that up with your mate Robbie Ball, yeah. who he played with Calder Cannons as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He so, how did it. it all come about? Um, so, obviously, Dim was huge at the tags of um, making sure you do stuff off field. Like in my first few years, if you weren't doing stuff off field, like you weren't allowed to play. I don't know if that was just a scare tactic or, or not, but. Dimmer was huge on um, boys pursuing stuff off field because footy may only last three, four, or five years. Like, you don't know. Um, yeah. Anyway, so, like, I've been pretty close with Robbie since I was probably 10 years old. Like, he played for Manu Valley. I was playing at West Coburg. Like, we always played against each other. Then we played with each other at the Cannons. Um, and he came, he, he was trying to buy a birthday present for a mate and he was trying to buy a watch. But the, wa- the watches are either too cheap and crappy or they were too expensive. Like, there was no mid range watches. So he just come to me with the idea and I said, yeah, like, yeah, I'll be keen as. Um, and then, yeah, sort of, I guess the hardest thing to, like, starting a company is to get a bloody name. Like, we had so many names that we tried to, to put forward and, like, yeah. they were just taken. Like, our first guy was, we had a name called Flinders and we started creating a few watches called, with Flinders on it and then, you know, we nearly got sued <laughs> by this <laughs> other company that was named Flinders. So we had to, like, scrap that really quick and then, I don't know, like, he came up with a few names, Arnie Jack, Uncle Jack, Arnie Jude, Uncle Jude. We're like, you know what, Uncle Jack seems like a, not too bad, then it? Like, he'd fit on the watch really well. And we're like, all right. Yeah, yeah, I, it's, I it's think that's the one. Yeah, and then everyone thought I named it after Jack Rewald, and I was like, no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, that was, I guess that was sort of the hardest part. But, um, yeah, we've had that for nearly seven years now, and, yeah, it's just sort of gone a lot bigger than what we thought. Um, you know, we on our first night, I think we sold, you know, 60 or 70. We're like, man, this is awesome. And then, like, two years later, like, we were punching out more than 1,000 on launch night. So, like, just, yeah, it was huge. And, you know what, hats off to, like, Robbie. Like, he's honestly the brains behind it. Does all, like, the hard work, the dirty work. Obviously, you know, my strengths are, like, getting it onto athletes and, and to yep. people that have profiles and that. But, like, he, um, yeah, behind the scenes, man, he's done a power of work. And, yeah, it wouldn't be where it is without him today. So um, he's been awesome. And, um, yeah, hopefully it can keep, you know, going well. But one day it might have to fizzle out. But hopefully not anytime soon. <laughs> no, no, man. that's It's not fizzling out, bro. It's stayed the test of time. One thing that I've loved about Uncle Jack is, like you said, the collabs you've done with players. Yeah. Like, you've been able to get guys from each team, do their watches, um and sort of incorporate it through and it's like from someone now that's like oh, look oh, by no means am I a business whiz or anything like that but yeah. you can understand like the marketability around that and like how how good that is to actually lean on your connections and to be able to you know start a business while you're in footy and that's what I always say to kids like um you know the young boys coming through yeah he's like if you'd 
ever start something like you got to start it early in your career so yep. you can just use it while you're while you're coming through and you've done that better than anyone man so yeah couldn't agree super more. proud of you from that aspect but um guys as well and girls the link will be in the show notes <laughs> uncle jack watches make sure you go and check them out get one for your mum get one for your dad get one for your brother and sister christmas soon and um everyone will be happy um everyone will be happy mate uh to to finish up towards the end um this yeah. weekend um, Ooh, yeah. interesting time for yourself. Obviously, you're in Gold Coast at the moment. Are you going to go to the game, the grand final, Richmond versus Geelong? Um, it's at the Gabra, obviously. Were you, were you trekked down? Um, oh, I was humming and harring all weekend because it's a night game in Brisbane and like having yeah. to get home. But you know what? I beat the ball and like, you know, I want to go watch my boys play. So I'm definitely going to go. Got a few tickets. Um, so yeah, just going to make a day of it. And I think it's the two best teams playing off. So I think it's going to be a fantastic contest. Um, you know, Geelong yeah. have been star for so long and, the Tigers just know how to win, so um, I'll be definitely rooting for the boys. But, um, yeah, looking forward to a good one. As much as you want the boys to win, there must be a, a little bit inside. <laughs> is, there, is there, or I don't I don't want to assume, but, like, if I'm thinking from my point of view, is there a side of you that thinks, like, far out, like, I would still love to, you know, to be competing in a grand final? Like, is there a party that still wants to do that, or are you just sort of happy for them to, to do that now? No, oh, I'd be you know be sort of wrong if there wasn't you know a part of me that would love to still be a part of it and to be playing off in a grand final like don't get me wrong i'm bloody jealous um yeah as i said like it'd be wrong if i wasn't but like i'm just i'm super happy for them because like i know how hard they've worked and how much it means to them and like i've just got to keep remembering and reminding myself why you know i left and you know the journey that i'm on now like that's all in the past um yeah and you know, I've got still got some great mates there that I'd love for them to, to win their third one. Or even some boys that miss out in seventeen like McIntosh and Short and Bolton, um, for them to win their second. So um yeah, fuck it. It's gonna be weird, don't get me wrong, but like, you know, I'm I'm so happy for them. If you had to give us a tip for, for Norm, um, and some guys that you think we might not know about that will play really important roles on yeah. the day, um, underrated sort of guys, you know, that money ball type player, who would who would you say? Man, if they don't sit on Lambert, he could have a great night. He's, he's an absolute star. He loves big games. He does. And you can't, honestly, you can't go past Dusty. Like, I yeah. got, Guthrie will probably go to him and tag him, but when he sits forward, like, he's untaggable. Um, so he could easily kick four or five. But even maybe Shea Bolton or Dion Prescott. Man, he, Shea Bolton, I, like, mm. I must have been sleeping for a little while because, like, all, he just came out of nowhere. Like, this obviously didn't come out of nowhere. Like, he's been doing his thing, but he's just gone from genuine, like, star. Like, he's yeah. so silky. No, he is. Um, and, yeah, I think, yeah, because there's going to be a lot of attention probably on, you know, Kochi, Dusty, Prestia, um, maybe even Basher and Kane. Like, he could just go under the radar, and um, if he gets his tail up, he's hard to stop. He's just so good. Um, you know, he's, he's a pleasure to watch, but... Yeah, I, I can't go past Dusty. You can't. <laughs> no, you, <laughs> you can't. can't. You, yeah, you can't. I, I honestly think he'll he'll definitely be a, a three time norm, um, which is which is special, yeah. mate. To finish up, um, you got you know a ten year career up there at, at the Suns, which is going very nicely. <laughs> Hopefully, a few more flags on the horizon. But off field, post footy, what what is ideally life like for for Brandon Ellis? What have you have, have you put any thought into that yet? Is it yeah. is it running the business still or footy or? Um, yeah, definitely have to start putting thought into it now that I'm at the back end of my career. Um, I mean, like, I, lo- I love the gym. Like, I'm into my fitness. Like, um, yeah, I just I love going to the gym. It makes me just happy. It makes me feel good. So I'd love to get into a gym, you know, post-footy or open up my own one, you know, in the next couple of years. Um, we'll see how that goes. But um, definitely in the fitness industry, that's what I'd, I'd love to stay in, you know. I can't sit still, like sitting still for this last hour and a bit. It's, it's getting a bit twitchy. Like I need, to, I need to do something hands on. Um, so yeah, I think definitely in the fitness industry. But um, we'll see how footy goes. Maybe um, go spend a year in Bali and just live there and live it up because I love that joint <laughs> so much. <laughs> you yeah. are the king of Bali, oh, Brandon Ellis, it. mate. Thank you so much for your time, bro. Genuinely, um, it's it's been mind-blowing it's been incredible um i'm so grateful for you to come on and share your story you're, you're one of the best dudes i've honestly had the pleasure of of knowing um and yeah just to sit down and and, and hear your story firsthand this time I, I honestly couldn't be happier um so many good things coming your way my friend with that mindset and and um yeah real blessed to sit down bro so i can't thank you enough for your time ah thanks man it's been a pleasure it's probably been 
53 weeks too late, but no, thanks for having me on. (laughs) This episode was brought to you by Jim Beam, the official spirit of the AFL. Let me just say this, I am excited. Summer is upon us. There is nothing better than sitting back with your friends in the sun enjoying a Jim Beam. That's why our good friends at Jim Beam are running a competition to win a tiny still house. It's like a small bar for your backyard, so as soon as the sun starts coming out, you can host your mates. I'm bloody excited for you. Head to www.jimbeampromotions.com.au forward slash tiny still house to enter. There's a bunch of awesome runner-up prizes too. The link is also in the show notes. Check it out. Get in quick. Entries close 11th of November. Good luck.